Galatians chapter 5. Turn there in your Bibles if you would. Uh, maybe you heard the story this past week, guy out hiking by himself up in Colorado, highest, highest mountain in Colorado, gets lost, right? He gets lost out there in Colorado, and he was gone for 24 hours before he eventually made it back to his car, but he could have been rescued a lot sooner had he answered his phone, and you want to know why he didn't answer his phone? Because he didn't recognize the number. Right? Like, are you, that, are you that cautious? I mean, it's one thing to be on top of the highest peak in Colorado and have someone say, hey, I want to talk to you about extending your car's warranty. Right? Like, are we, are, we, are we thinking it's that kind of call? But here's the fact. They were calling him repeatedly, and he kept disregarding the call. And we're, th- we're thinking to ourselves, like, you know, you're lost. Are you, are you going to ignore the call? And I'm thinking to myself, How many of us this morning are getting a call from God? And here's my encouragement to you. Answer the phone. Amen? Answer the phone. We're all lost. Uh, Whether you think you're good or not, we're all lost to some degree. And I think we're lost particularly in this area we're going to talk about today, and that's the area of joy. God is going to call you today and get your attention today. Answer the phone and understand what God wants you to understand about joy. Because joy, I would believe, is one of the major marks of being a a follower of Jesus. If there's no joy in our lives, something's, something's wrong. Something's amiss. And so part of me wants you to be aware of the joy that only God can give us as human beings because we all are wired with this capacity for joy but maybe you're you you follow Jesus and you've lost the joy or you're trying to recapture the joy and I pray that this morning the the scripture passages we're going to look at and I'm going to tell you right now a lot so let's just take our hands out and exercise make sure we don't get any like carpal tunnel syndrome or something like that I'm going to have you write down a lot of verses I think Paul how many verses we got today 30 40 50 Something We might just say the whole scripture. So take your Bibles out. We're going to be looking at this jumping off point, Galatians 5. Turn there in your Bibles if you would. This is our series called Planted. Um, talking about the fruit of the Spirit. This, these are the things that are produced by the Spirit. Joy is not something you pursue. Joy is something that happens to you as a result of relationship. And it's not in possessions, and it's not in people, and it's not in your pursuits that you find joy. Your singular joy can only be found and satisfied in relationship with God. That's, that's the big point. That's the big overarching idea this morning. And God wants to remind us of this. Last week we looked at love. That's an important topic. It's an important characteristic of us as, as believers in Christ. But joy is something unique. When you, when you love God and love others, like we were talking about last week, and that results in serving, and, w- and we made that conclusion from Galatians 5, there's something deeply satisfying in that. So joy is one of those things that I think is important for us to wrap our minds around. It's not happiness. Can you just write down the word happy and then a big, like, cancel it out? We are going to cancel happy today. Because God has never used the word happy in relationship to our lives with him and with each other as if happiness was the end-all, be-all pursuit. I'm going to tell you right now, men and women are continually and daily coming up short, dead ends, destructed lives. Because why? They're pursuing happiness. We're not talking about happiness. The Bible never talks about happiness. See, happiness is superficial. Happiest, uh, happiness can be trivial. It can be, it can be one of these things that is uh, sentimentalized. God wants to take us deeper, and that's why we use the word joy. See, joy is deep. Joy is profound. Joy is stable. And we look at Galatians chapter 5, and this is something that God wants to produce in us by means of his spirit. Look at Galatians 5 verse 16. I say to you, walk by the spirit, and you're not going to carry out the desires of the flesh. And then you skip down to verse 22, and the Spirit's going to produce these things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And so this morning we get to talk about the topic of joy. And this is fun because last week we talked about love. And I I mentioned to you John is the apostle of love. And I talked about a leather jacket bedazzled saying, you know, wouldn't that be cool to have like a gang? Like we're the disciples of love, right? John is the apostle of love. Paul is the apostle of joy. Write that down. Paul 
is the Apostle Joy. 21 times Paul uses the word joy in his writings. The closest is John who uses the word joy nine times. So while John may be the Apostle of love, Paul is the disciple or Apostle of joy. Consider the book of of Philippians. Turn to Philippians right now. I'm going to give you the shortest Bible study in Philippians you've ever experienced through the entire book, four, four chapters. And I want you to see something profound in, in, the, in the book of Philippians. Because Philippians is about joy, especially joy in difficult circumstances. And I'm going to tell you this morning, and we're going to get to this point eventually, probably in about 30, 35 minutes. So just heads up. That it's in the difficult places where your most deep, deepest satisfying joy is to be discovered. Paul is in prison in the book of Philippians. And he's writing a book about joy while he is in this despairing, discouraging situation, this context where he himself says, I'm going to die. Matter of fact, he says, I'm going to be beheaded. And yet I'm rejoicing. And we sit there and go, how the heck do you do that? So here's as the doctor of your souls this morning, I'm going to require this of you. Take two book of Philippians every day and call me next week and see how you're doing. I'm going to encourage you to do this. Read through the book of Philippians at least twice a day for the next week. Four chapters. It's not long. Normal reading speed, it will take you 15 minutes. But I'm going to tell you what. The book of Philippians is God's prescription to us of how desperately we need to fight for joy. And And it is a fight. Joy just does not happen. Joy is a battle. And it's a battle for your hearts and your minds. And Paul, in the book of Philippians, gives us this incredible, incredible theology of what we can really rally and and just sink our our teeth into. So turn to Philippians real quick. Let's go through this really, really, really fast. So he's writing from prison. But you would never guess he's writing from prison because of the joy that he has in Christ. Remember, Paul was like, he was like the highest ranking Jewish religious leader in his day. He, he, had, he had gone to school, he was born in the right family, he, he, he said all the right things, he did all the right things, and then God changed his life. And whereas before, when he had all these achievements and accomplishments and positions and titles, there was no joy in his life, and it was when he was laid bare before the Lord and change, then he would say, that's when true joy entered my life. Kind of like C.S. Lewis. Now, I'm going to talk about Lewis a, a, a couple times this morning, because I think Lewis, he wrote a couple books. Matter of fact, uh, I just happened to bring one out of my collection, C.S. Lewis on Joy. It doesn't get any simpler than that. Uh, this book could be 10 times thicker than it is, but these are just little excerpts. Lewis wrote a book called Surprised by Joy, and I really recommend that book to you, because Lewis grew up in a context where religion was stale, it was lifeless, it was heartless, it was meaningless, and it wasn't until his friend J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings, led Lewis to the Lord, and Lewis wrote this book, Surprised by Joy, because he never thought a relationship with God could be so exciting. Pretty awesome. So we'll come back to Lewis here in a moment, but look at at the Philippians. So starting at chapter 1, verse 12. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances, he's in jail, tied to soldiers night and day, 24-7. He's he's tied to soldiers. He's facing death. I want you to know that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Stop right there. Lewis considers everything that's happened to his life as as an opportunity to share God with people. And literally, when, when Paul had a captive audience, guess who the captive truly was? It wasn't Paul. Paul seized every opportunity that he was chained to a Roman soldier as an opportunity to tell those soldiers about Jesus. And we know that in the Roman household, people were coming to know Jesus because of Paul. What a huge part of our journey as believers when it comes to joy is to use the things that happen to us as leverage points to point people to a greater truth, and that's our joy in Jesus. You can't control what happens to you in life, but you can control how you respond to those things. So Paul says, verse 13, so that my imprisonment is the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and everyone else, and that most of the brethren trusting the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. You hear hear the excitement? Like he's saying, I'm here 
and I'd rather not be here, but I'm here, and I'm using this current location as an opportunity to tell people about Jesus. And he says, I'm rejoicing in this. Because the gospel is spreading in those areas that most of us would sit there and go, I'm, I'm too swallowed up by self-pity. I'm too swallowed up by discouragement. I'm too swallowed up by despair. I can't think about Jesus at this moment. And Paul would say, why? Why? Has your heart and your soul not been captured by Jesus? That doesn't matter where you are in life, you can use it as an opportunity to glorify him and share Jesus with others. Look at this. Some, to be sure, verse 15, are preaching Christ from envy and strife. So now he talks about other people talking about the gospel and how they're doing it differently than him. He doesn't bag on them. He actually celebrates the fact that, hey, you know, at least Christ is preached. That's the kind of attitude I want as a pastor. Sometimes I fall into like, yeah, I wouldn't do it their way, and I wouldn't do it that way. But I'm sitting there going, but Jesus is being preached. So who am I? Look at verse 18. What then? Only that in every, uh, every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. Pretty awesome. Go to chapter 2. So he's, he's talking about that. In chapter 1, he says, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Like his perspective is, is just awesome. Chapter 2, he starts out, don't think of others. Think of others as more important than yourself, right? And then he says, this is the way of Jesus. And then in verse 12 and 13, he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And then verse 17, chapter 2, but even if I am being poured out as a drink offering, this is Paul's way of saying, I'm about ready to die. I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith. I rejoice and share in my joy with you all. If you were facing death, inevitable death, would you be speaking words of joy? Like this. See, Paul goes, my association with Jesus, association with Jesus has brought me to this point, and there's no place I'd rather be. Look at verse 18. And you too, I urge you, I command you. Write down the word command. This is something we're going to touch on here in a moment. The Bible commands you to be joyful. And to not be joyful is a sin. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. Paul's language says this, you too, I command you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Meaning there's nothing else I want to celebrate than the fact that not only is Christ being preached, but we get to lay our lives down for the gospel. How many of you are ready to do this? Don't worry, there's no executions happening today. Maybe tomorrow, but not today. Look at chapter, uh, end of chapter 2, verse 28. He says, therefore I have sent, he's talking about the people he's ministered with, Epaphroditus. He says, Therefore, I have sent him all the more eagerly in order that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. Here's Paul's concern is that the church would be encouraged. He's the one who's probably in desperate need of encouragement. And yet he's the one bound and shackled and chained saying to the church, I want to encourage you. Whoa, you ever met somebody like this with such deep faith that they're the ones in this very difficult spot, but they're the one encouraging you? Boy, I want that kind of faith. Skip to chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. There it is, the command. Rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me. I wanna, I wanna, I'm writing to you. I want to remind you of things. Celebrate what God is doing. Because Paul would tell you in chapter 3 that everything he has surrendered for Jesus is a happy surrender. Think about this. Look at, look at verse 8. Uh, no, verse 7. But whatever things were gained to me, those things that I accounted so important, right, in my life, things that I gained so much joy from, I have gotten rid of. Because I have found a supreme joy, right? I consider all things lost for the sake of Christ. And for this I pursue and I, and I strive for, that I may know him. Here's what God wants you to know. There is no joy, true joy, real joy outside of God. He has yet to learn that. We're going to pray for that little guy right there, right? He doesn't know. He thinks like a Tonka truck is, is joy. No, boy, no. Look at uh, chapter 4, verse 4. So rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. So you see how just Paul comes back to this theme. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Rejoice, and again I say Rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. 
The Lord is near. Think about verse 5, chapter 4. How powerful that is. He's keeping things in perspective. Your forbearance in whatever you're going through right now is not necessarily for you, but it's for other people. And your attitude and perspective should be this, that God is coming back. And we don't know when, but he's coming back, and that's our hope. That's why he can say then in verse 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and thanksgiving, uh, with, and, and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. God doesn't only want, it's not that God doesn't want to hear your difficulties and your pains, but he also wants you to be thankful because your thankfulness is rooted in something deeper than your circumstances. What does he say? In the peace of God, verse 7, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, right? So finally, brethren, look at verse 8. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is, is of good repute, if there's anything excellent, if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. Where your mind is, is so key to fueling and filling what's going on in your heart. And then he says, this is crazy, right? Go, jump down to verse 10. And I rejoice in the Lord greatly. Again, there it is. I'm rejoicing in the Lord greatly. Why? That you have revived my, you, my concern. You were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want. Look at verse 11. These are key verses. I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Is that sometimes where our joy is sucked away because life isn't working out the way we want it to work out? Paul says, I've learned that the art, contentment is the secret to joy. And he says this, verse 12, I know how to get along with humble means, and I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. Verse 13, everyone knows this verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, you're a cheater if you just isolate that verse and want to go out in the football field and be like, yeah, I can do all things. I can tackle you. I can sack you. I can do whatever. That's not what Paul means. This is the, one of the greatest verses that's hijacked out of the context of what it's supposed to be appropriately said in. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you when you're in the cauldron, when you're in the fire, when you're in the difficulty of life. And the world is saying, don't trust God, and yet the Spirit of Christ is saying, cling to Jesus, because that's all you got. You want to quote that verse? Make sure it's in context. Look at verse 14. Nevertheless, I have done, you have done well to share with me in my affliction, like he's thanking the church for just praying for him. And you yourselves know, Philippians, at the first preaching of the gospel, right? Um, it, you, you share with me in this matter of giving, receiving, but... Even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift. Verse 17, not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account, meaning the spiritual dividends that God is able to do through your service, through your attitudes, through your actions. And I have received everything in full and have an abundance. Paul's saying, I lack nothing. I've got Jesus. When you have Jesus, you have no need. When you have Jesus, you have no need. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphrodite what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God, and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Wow. Your God can take care of you no matter what. If he has saved your soul from the fires of hell, he can take care of your daily skirmishes that you enter into. Guaranteed. Take two Philippians a day and call me next week. I'm serious. Read through Philippians twice a day this week and, and watch what God will do. I say that because I want to get to five points. My wife's laughing, going, here he goes. All right, two-hour message. No, just kidding. Hour, 30 minutes. All right, take out your notes. Five things I believe God wants us to know. And, and, and here's what I think the overarching theme of Philippians is, which is going to really kind of dovetail nicely into what we're going to talk about this morning. Don't believe a lie that someone will tell you that joy will come into your life when the clouds of darkness finally disappear. You don't need to wait for the clouds to disappear to have joy. Don't believe in a God who can't give you joy in the most despairing and desperate of circumstances. I don't want a God like that. Paul would say, believe in a God who meets you in those despairing places. 
and solidifies your hope in him that no matter what the outcome of your situation may be, you've got him and that's all that matters. Five points. First one is this that you need to understand is that there's the existence of satisfying joy. So many of us, I think, probably in this room this morning, have never tasted satisfying joy. Yet it exists. God has created us with capacity for joy, and that joy to be truly satisfied must be rooted in God. See, we, we, we live in, Lewis calls the world we live in the shadow lands. There's things, there's people, there's circumstances that, that can be pleasing, but those things are not to, be, not to be sought after as if there's ultimate joy found in them. There's, there are typologies, there's shadows of, of greater realities. Here's what Lewis says, one of the great quotes. Listen to this, wrap your brain around. I know it's 9.30, some of your brains haven't even turned on yet. But listen to what Lewis says, check this out. All joy reminds. It is never a possession, always a desire for something longer ago, further away, or still about to be. Isn't that awesome? Some of you are like, I have no idea what that meant. (laughs) All joy reminds. So whatever is going on in your spirit, God has wired you to remind you of something. Lewis says this, it's never a possession, meaning don't you dare look for it in things you want to buy or own or even even in relationships with people. It's always a desire for something longer ago, further away, or still about to be. Maybe that's what the psalmist meant when he said the spirit works in our lives and deep calls to deep. That we live in this world created by God, and we as the pinnacle of his creation exist for relationship. And that deep hunger can only be satisfied in a deep God. That's why Psalm 1611, I love this verse. Matter of fact, I taught it at the junior high, this verse, a couple times ago. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. We could just preach on that verse this morning, but we're not going to. But what does God do? He invites us. Come to me, all you who are dissatisfied with living your life. Come to me, all you who have labored so strenuously to, to, to be involved with drink and sex and ambition and hobbies and have found those things to be hollow or shallow or lifeless. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and find that in relationship with me there is rest. That's exactly what Isaiah 55 says. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come, buy, eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Now, as someone who has the spiritual gift of eating, this is a good reminder That while I may worship over a good Thai lunch, while I may worship at the all-you-can-eat sushi bar, while I may dine at Del Taco, have you ever been there? It's exquisite. (laughs) Nothing satisfies like God. This is what God is saying. You settle. And in your settling, there's such deep satisfaction. God says this, don't miss me. Don't miss me. John 15, 11, this is what Jesus invites us into. These things I have spoken to you that you, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. He's not going to replace our joy, but what he's going to do, he's going to work his joy into our joy so that our fullness of joy is a complete experience. 
God wants you to be joyful in the things that he's joyful in and teach you the, the, the ways of deep satisfaction. So our lack of joy and our, our problems, you guys, it's, it's because we're looking for joy in all the wrong places. Looking for joy in all the wrong places. That, that should be the name of that song. I know it's not. Some of you are like, you don't know your music. Oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> don't we look for joy in all the wrong places? Ecclesiastes chapter 2. You want to read a book? Cynical, sarcastic. Ecclesiastes is God's book in the Bible, 12 chapters, that says you can try to find joy in all the things that the world clamors to find joy in. You're going to come up empty. This is why the conclusion of Ecclesiastes chapter 12 says, here's what I found out. After all my carousing, after all my drinking, after all my sex, here's what really matters. Fear God and keep his commandments. But in chapter 2, look what he says. I said in my heart, come, I'm going to test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad and of pleasure. What use is it? I searched with all my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on to folly till I might see what is good, what is good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. He basically says, I'm looking around me, and everyone's on this pursuit that's going to end up in destruction. Read chapter 2, the rest of it later. Oh, so good. Lewis would say, Joy is never in our power, but oftentimes pleasure is. You're not, this is not pleasure. And pleasure is a cheap, cheap substitute for joy. Pleasure comes after you find your joy in God. Psalm 1611, right? Find your way to me, relationship, and in my right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 1611, write that down, memorize it. I was thinking this week, I, I heard that story about the Japanese princess. Do you hear about this? I love princess stories, so of course it caught my eye. <laughs> Japanese princess who basically walked away from royalty to marry a commoner. And the, the internet was abuzz. Oh, how could she do this? Kind of like, you know, what Markle and, and Prince Harry, right? Meghan Markle and Prince Harry did, right? Like, oh! How can someone do this? And matter of fact, in the interview, I listened to this, and here's what one of the phrases was. When you think about the cost benefits, all that she has to give up and give away, it just doesn't seem worth it. And I'm sitting here going, that person who's doing the report doesn't understand what love looks like. Now, I don't know where the Japanese princess stands when it comes to her relationship with God, but she has found something that is so amazing that she's willing to give up royalty to have it. This is the gospel invitation to us. Give up everything that the world would put value upon and exchange it to have a relationship with God. Jesus says you'll never be disappointed. Matthew 13, 44. I'm going to skip a couple of verses, Paul, if you would. The shortest parable in the Bible, one of the greatest parables ever. The kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field. And when a man finds it, he covers it up, and then in his joy, don't miss that phrase, with all the joy he can muster up, goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Here's my prayer for you, church, and pray for me. With as tantalizing as the temptations are daily that we experience, with as, as alluring as all the things of this world sparkle and shine and want our attention, Nothing brings greater joy than you anchored in relationship with God. And everything is well worth turning in to have God. That I pray, Lord, may nothing be seen as more valuable than relationship with you because the things that we put value on will, will edge out God of our lives. And then you come crying and saying, I, I don't sense God, I don't feel God, I'm not, there's no joy, and I'm sitting there going, what are you exchanging for the Lord, because all of us make the exchange on a daily basis. I'd rather have this than him. I'd rather feel this than that. Point number two, the importance of saving joy. First, you've got to be safe. You've got, you've got to know salvation. You've got to be anchored in relationship with Jesus Christ. So Lewis says this. I love, again, sorry. Lewis, Lewis talks a lot about joy. This is one of his favorite topics. 
he would say that joy is the serious business of heaven, which is such a great quote, right? He says this, if you want to get warm, you must stand near the fire. If you want to be wet, you must get into the water. If you want joy, power, peace, eternal life, you must get close to or even into the thing that has them. They are not a sort of prize which God could, if he chose, just hand out to anyone. And isn't that what we think God does? We think that God is just this distributor of stuff that's going to make us happy or make us content or fulfill our wildest dreams. And God says, I'm not going to hand anything out to you. I'm going to invite you into relationship. Because only in me can you have joy. This is why there's the importance of saving joy. Real joy comes to us from God. Last week we looked at Romans 5, 5. God, through his spirit, has poured out his love within us. And I will tell you, the greatest joy any human being can ever experience is being saved by God. And all God's people said, yeah. Luke 20, 10, 20. Okay, disciples just come back from... I would think it would make a Billy Graham crusade look like child's play. They come back from this whirlwind tour. It's the Jesus tour. First century. Here we go. The disciples go out. They're casting out demons. They're seeing miracles, right? They come back and they're like, oh, Jesus, you should have seen all the cool ministry stuff we were doing. And Jesus, you know, what I love is sometimes he just rains on our parade. He says, don't rejoice in all the success you had in ministry. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Because I'm going to tell you right now, there is no greater joy than to be saved by God. This is why Luke 15, 7, Jesus says, there is no greater joy in heaven than over one sinner repenting. You see how God defines joy? God defines joy in your life being changed and being ushered from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of his marvelous light. This is how God defines joy. Joy is you being in your shackles, being released so you're liberated now in Jesus. Joy is being set free from being a slave to unrighteousness to now being a slave to righteousness. Joy is God knowing every single thing about you, which you dare not want anyone else to know about you, and yet being loved like you've never been loved and accepted like you've never been accepted. You see how God defines joy. Joy is the fact that your name is recorded in heaven. Woo! Come on, world, throw what you want at me because nothing can alter that position in Christ. The sower and the seed parable, Matthew 13. Jesus says this, there this the seed of the, of the gospels poured out there. As for what the sown, uh, was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, he immediately falls away. See, th there is a belief in the gospel that's not a true saving belief. Because all of a sudden, hard times come, and I'm going to tell you right now, hard times are guaranteed for every follower of Jesus. Your faith is measured as far as it's genuineness when you go through the thick times and the dark times it's not the feasting times i'm i'm excited about your faith it's during the the famine years jesus describes that as for what was sown among the thorns this is the one who hears the word but cares of the world and the deceitful the deceitfulness of riches choke the word right and it proves unfruitful these are the people who try to find joy in stuff and possessions but what was sown on good soil, Jesus says, this is the one who hears the word, understands it. He indeed bears fruit, Galatians 5, and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another 60, another 30. The true believer will not only be rooted in genuine faith, but they will be fruitful because of the genuineness of their faith. God calls you, me, to joy in him. If it's not involving God, there's no joy involved. So my question to you is, what are you exchanging that the world would deem valuable so that you may have Jesus? 
And there's not a man or woman I've ever met who exchanged something that the world put a value on in order that they wanted Jesus more, and they come back and said, I'm really disappointed in that trade-off. Point number three. See, it's not just the fact that there is this, um, this joy, that, this desire for joy within us, and that God saves us for joy. But here's kind of where we, we cut to the chase. What about the experience of supernatural joy? I'm not asking you to, to believe in Jesus and then just go ahead and live your life however you want. This is where I, as a pastor, have such an important role in your lives, and you have an important role in my life, to st- stick fast to, to what we say we believe about God. I, I want you to experience supernatural joy on a, on, a, on a consistent basis. Matter of fact, famous pastor said it this way, Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the word and in the world. I like that. My goal, my prayer, as yours ought to be for me, is to have joy that continues to be anchored in Christ, in the Word, and how God is working in the world. So how do we experience this joy? Look at Romans chapter 14, verse 17. First, you ought to be a part of His kingdom. The kingdom of God is breaking into this world even as we speak. Here's what's really cool. Kingdom of God is breaking into this room right here, right now in someone's life. I I truly believe that. And how do we define the kingdom of God? Here's how Paul defines it. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, right? Again, the things that you and I would get excited about, like, oh, I'm joyful because my sports team won. I'm joyful because that margarita was the bomb. I'm joyful because, you know what, she's great in bed. No! Those are pleasures, but they're not joy. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking. It is a matter of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So my son this week goes, Dad, one of your posts got fact-checked on Facebook. Has anyone been there yet? I, I kind of felt like, oh, finally, good. Like, I don't, what does that mean, fact-checked? So I texted him this morning. I said, hey, send me the thing I got fact-checked on, right? So I'm thinking to myself, I don't really post, like, controversial things. I mean, they're definitely faith-based, Jesus-focused type stuff, but... He goes, Dad, you got fact checked in September. I go, what was it? He goes, it was the post that said this, Christianity is not a religion. It is the announcement of the end of religion. And so it says, see why fact checkers say this is false. I'm like, oh, this will be fun. Are we going to get into a little theological argument now with Facebook or whatever? Um, it said this false. The same false information was reviewed in another post by fact checkers. There may be small differences. Independent fact checkers say this information has no basis in fact. <laughs> like I was tossing and turning, losing sleep last night over this, right? Whatever. But isn't it cool? Whoa, my wife's jamming over there. Is that your boyfriend over there singing to you? I love her. Did you know I got fact checked, babe? You still want to be married to me? Okay. Here's the thing, which is really cool. I'm glad they fact checked it. I'm glad someone took the time to look at it. Because Christianity is not religion. Christianity is the end of religion. All religions outside of Christianity are self-righteous, self-motivated, involve explore your heart, explore your life, do whatever makes you feel good. Here's what Christianity says. Doing what makes you feel good has led you to the place of despair where you're at now. How's that, how's that working out for you? It is the end of religion and is the introduction of the kingdom that brings righteousness and peace and joy. And what's the key to experiencing supernatural joy? John 15. Turn your Bibles there. John 15. If I'm not going to tell you Philippians, take two Philippians a day and call me next week, uh, John 15 is awesome. This is the abiding. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's, there's really nothing I can tell you other than encourage you to just cling to Christ. Abide in Him. Spend time with Him. 
Jesus' joy is always fullness of joy. Our joy, and, the, and depending on how full our joy is, is dependent on your abiding. Your reservoir of joy can be, can, can be empty. And when it's empty, it's because you're not abiding. Abiding is the spiritual gas station you fill up your joy tank. Does that sound weird and crude? I hope so. Because we, we can't seem to get our minds around this. You don't need another Bible study. You don't need to go to a conference. You don't need the, you know, Caleb to give you your power verse of the day and your 10 favorite worship songs. You don't need that. What you need is abiding with Christ to say, you're the most important relationship to me. I will notch out time to spend time with you. Good luck on a marriage where you say, you know, I'll see you in a week. If my wife said, hey, tell you what, we're not talking all week, but I'll catch up with you next Sunday, you better believe hell hath no fury like a woman talked to like that. Can I get an amen from somebody? Jesus is saying daily, I want to dine with you. I want to feast with you. I want to give you water. I want to give you milk. I want to give you the best spiritual buffet you've ever had. And it's up to you to experience supernatural joy. The reason you're not joy-filled is because you're not abiding. John 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I don't know how Jesus can get any clearer. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch, dries up, gather him, cast him into the fire, right? If if there's no abiding, it actually reveals a deeper sickness, and that is you're probably not changed or converted. If there's no desire to abide, you may embrace a false faith. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, it shall be done for you. This is how my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you, so abide in my love. Keep my commandments, abide in my love, just as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that your joy may be, my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Here's the end result. We don't do these things as if we're task-oriented. We always do this because it's relationship-oriented. And when you spend time with Jesus and hang out with him and abide in him, not only are you able to pray crazy prayers, before a God that you're cultivating this relationship with. But you're going to experience joy like you've never, ever had before. The problem is we oftentimes don't abide with Jesus. We're, we, we can abide with a lot of other things. We abide with Netflix. Amen? We abide with our favorite sports commentator. We abide with, we spend time, intimate time with things that don't bring us joy. You know, I was so mad this week. So, furious outrage moment of the week. When the, uh, so day of the game, Cardinals Packers. Let's just take a moment and mourn. Not 8 no, 7 1, whatever, right? If it's not the Cowboys, I'm for the Cardinals, just so you guys know. But the Cardinals are playing the Packers Thursday night. And I was so mad because a local Arizona radio station decided, hey, it would be fun to give Packers fans some radio time because we want to hear why they like the Packers. I'm sitting there yelling at my radio going, who cares? Like, that's all I need. We already know that the stadium is going to be this blend of red and green and gold and and whatever. My thought is, you're in Arizona. Let's flood the airwaves with Cardinals positivity. Let's flood the airways with like Cardinals fans being like, yeah! But instead, these guys are giving time to the Packers fan. And I'm going, cheeseheads, dumbheads, if you ask me, let's be honest, right? Is anyone a Packers fan here? Sorry, I love you, I love you, I love you. In Jesus, I love you, okay. But you know what I mean? You're sitting there going, I don't think in, 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 in Green Bay, they're giving Arizona Cardinals people time of day on their radio. And I'm listening to that and I go, What an appropriate illustration of how oftentimes we give the enemy a voice in our heads. Now, I know the Packers are a sports enemy. We're called to love all people. I don't hate Aaron Rodgers. He's a pretty amazing quarterback. But here's what I'm telling you. You are choosing, I am choosing frequently to give voice to the person that doesn't want me to be joyful, but they want me to be joy empty. Who are you giving your time to? 
Seize the day today and understand that your time is precious. Stop listening to the voices that have nothing to do about your soul. They don't care one bit about your soul. Jesus says the enemy has come to rob and kill and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Abide. That's what God is saying. Abide. But here it is. Point number four. We're, we're, we're making headway, you guys. Another hour, we're done. All right. Just kidding. Point number four. But here is the point I dread to share with you. Because this is often where joy grows the most if we allow it to. And that is this, the perseverance in sanctifying joy. God will sanctify you, meaning grow you spiritually, often in the most difficult of circumstances. So here's what I'm going to argue with you for the next few minutes. It's that we often don't understand James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet various trials, or trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And steadfastness, well, when it has its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now I'm going to tell you right now, who in their right mind counts it all joy when you go through difficult times? We don't do this naturally. This is, this is the person that's like, you're like, you're crazy. And yet, it is through our difficulties that God wants us to experience the greatest joy, but you've got to embrace them. Your trials are from God. And they are designed to draw you closer to Christ and conform you into his image. I'm going to rest, think, meditate. Your trials are not meant to be escaped from. They are not to be avoided. When trials come into your life, you accept them, you embrace them as God's gift, i.e. teacher, so that you are taught to cling and abide in Christ like you've never clinged and abided in him before so that you may come out the other end when God chooses to end that course in, in difficulty. Because in the end, if you've learned the lessons God wants you to learn, you're going to come out better. You're going to come out stronger. But this is not the way we think about the Christian life. No one ever enters into the faith with someone saying, come to Jesus, I'm going to guarantee your life's going to become harder than it's going to become better. Who would sign on for, with Jesus like that? Like, no one ever showed me this. And I'm glad they did because it's one of those things where you, you have to walk through it. Can I tell you those moments in our lives, my wife and I were talking about this, these moments in our lives that made us the, the people we are today. The fact that my mom died of, of a brain tumor. At, at, I was 15, she was 39. I remember having a conversation outside my house with my dad where my dad is asking a 15-year-old teenage hormonal boy what we should do about his mom because they already had one surgery. They couldn't remove it all. Could we do a second, but she's going to live like a vegetable for a few months? Do we, just, do we do a second surgery to prolong her life, or do we just allow God to work out? And he's asking me my advice. And I told my dad, I said, I don't want mom to suffer any more than she has to. And God literally took her within a matter of a couple weeks. I was, a, I was a month old in Jesus at this time. And what God taught me in those, those moments and in those months after, I would, n I would never, ever not want to go through. Difficult as they were, I would go through them again because of what God showed me about himself. Fast forward, marrying Lori, dealing with infertility, accepting what it was that we may never have kids, and me telling her that it was okay if we never had kids because my joy was going to be married to her the rest of our lives and to serve God wherever God might take us with or without children. Right? There's that acceptance. I can't control it. We don't have power over this, but I'm going to accept what it is. 
her journey with her mom through colorectal cancer, us journeying through a church that didn't want us, who asked for our resignation. All these things where God allowed it to happen in my lives that I would gladly go back into and do all over so that I may learn the lessons of what it means to abide in Jesus and cling to him like as if it was life or death. I am not preaching willpower religion. This is not dig deep and maybe you'll have that willpower to, to make it through. I am talking about Christ's power. Faith. That each of us needs so desperately that when you are in the thick of it and you're in that sh the, the valley of the shadow of death, you have a God who follows you with his mercy. You have a God who's prepared a table for you in the wilderness amidst your enemies. And he says, you, can con you don't have any control over your circumstances, but you have control of where your heart and your mind go. Will you trust God? And realize that every single circumstance that happens to you has been permitted by God to do something, and that is this, teach you how to trust in him. This is why we must rejoice. In the thick of it, it is the hardest thing to hear. When people say, rejoice in the Lord, and you're like, shut up. <laughs> but yet you know it's true. Because what's the alternative? Self-pity will destroy you. Despair will destroy you. This melancholy attitude before a, a holy, loving God will destroy you. Joy is not a natural reaction to hardship. Joy is not the absence of difficulties. It is the presence of the Spirit, and that's what the Spirit has to do in those moments. He's going to produce something in you that is hope-filled. The Spirit will produce something in you that is joyful. And here's the, here's the crazy thing is, I can't teach that to you. You have to walk through that yourselves. So here's what I'm saying. Prepare. Prepare. I don't know when it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And whether those are attacks from people or different circumstances or from within, I don't, whatever it may be, seize every opportunity to cling to your God and abide in Christ. And He will see you through. And I'm going to tell you something else real quick. It's this kind of joy in hard places. And I'm going to call it this. It's a peculiar joy. It's, it's the book of Acts. Where the people were imprisoned and beaten for their faith and then they're set free and they rejoice to suffer for Jesus. And you're going, what kind of sick people are these early believers? Don't go out and tell people about Jesus. And they're like, okay. And they go out and do it and they get arrested and beaten up again. And they consider it joyful to be associated with Christ. This is a peculiar joy. This is a joy that demonstrates something for the world that can only be produced by the Spirit that I think the world wants to, to know. When you demonstrate joy in trouble, difficulties, the world takes notice. Psalm 126, write that down, look at it this week. I love this psalm because the Israelites returned from Babylon to rebuild their city that had been destroyed, and they were in this hard situation. Jerusalem was in ruins, and they had no houses to live in, and the people around them opposed their presence. So imagine this, your city is leveled. People are mocking you and scoffing you. Where's your God now? You say to be your God's chosen people? Yeah, look how God, good your God takes care of you, right? They're oppressed. But they compose a hymn, Psalm 126. And here's what the hymn says. We were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongues with shouts of joy. And they said among the nations, the Lord must have done great things for them. Because we choose joy in the midst of trials and difficulties, 
the nations changed from being oppressive to being impressed because of the attitude in their life. Listen to that last phrase. The Lord must have done great things for them. Is the world saying that about your life? When they look at you going through all these difficulties, are they saying, man, the Lord must be doing great things in their life. See, facing hardships is an opportunity for us to demonstrate joy in such a way that the world goes, look how God has blessed them. Wow. Last point, we close with this. I know, I'm running out of time. And I have like 10 verses to give you, but I don't have enough time to do that. Can I tell you, I'll give you one verse, Hebrews 12, because I don't want Paul typed in, put these verses up. Thank you, Paul, for doing all that. Look at this. So here's the attitude. This transitions to the last point. We're going to look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Okay, notice, full joy in light of full pain and suffering. For the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Point number five, this is how we grow weary, not grow weary and faint-hearted. And here it is, the remembrance of secure joy. You have an eternal home waiting for you where God will wipe every tear from your eye. He will take every pain from your life. He will cure every disease that has ever ransacked your physical well-being, your emotional well-being. He will destroy every enemy. He will vindicate every wrongdoing. Your God promises you an eternal home where your joy is secure forever. That's why Jesus says one day you'll stand before him and he'll say, enter into the joy of your master. Notice the word he uses, joy. Here's what God wants us to know this morning. That we can rejoice in the midst of suffering because of Jesus, who himself secures and guarantees a future joy to all those he will redeem. John 16, 22. You have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Woo! Thank you, Lord! How about this one, Matthew 5, 12? Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For they, so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus says, there's always been wickedness that's done to the people of God. There's always been difficult circumstances that have, been, that have happened to the people of God. But here's what you rejoice in. There's a reward waiting for you that is great in heaven. Last verse. 1 Peter 1, verse 6 and 9. In this you rejoice. Now, context, 1 Peter, church that's going through suffering, difficulties, tribulations. In this you rejoice, Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, amen, We've, we're all grieved by the trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This supports my argument that God allows testing in your life, trials, to strengthen and prove the genuineness of your faith. First Peter. Don't miss this. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is what happens when you abide with Christ. He is the forerunner of your faith, anchored in heaven, him who is seated at the right hand of the Father. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? If you're in Christ, nothing can separate you from his love. You are his forever. Abide in that. And all God's people said, this is tough stuff. I even thought about calling in sick today. <laughs> Lord, I don't want to be the... 
But can we encourage one another, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. We have too much to be thankful for. Amen? Let's stand, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your reminders to us that we are not a people without hope. That we are people who are called your friends. And even greater than just being your friends, we are your sons and daughters. You've adopted us into your family. And now we are able to say we have a relationship with the God and creator of all. Lord, remind us that there is no greater pursuit than that of Psalm 16. The path that you have set of life that leads to you where there is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Lord, help us set our minds and hearts toward that that direction. Help us to to abide with Jesus so that that cultivation of that path of life is, is just forever in front of us. Give us the strength to weather whatever difficulties we may be going through. We we never want to minimize those things, but we definitely need to cling to Christ. And seek to glorify you in all things. So Father, thank you for the message today. That we can be a people who can rejoice in all things. Because we have Jesus. And Jesus is enough. Thank you for that beautiful, beautiful gift. And we pray this all in his name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Love you, church. Praying for you. See you soon. Bye-bye.